Welcome to section 4 of the course, S3 and CloudFront. In this section, we will be learning about what S3 is, what its performance is, as well as the data consistency. We will have a hands-on tutorial about how we can create an S3 bucket. We're going to learn about S3 storage options, the version control available to us, and the characteristics that it has. We're going to look at lifecycle rules and what they are and how we can transition data. We're going to have a look at CloudFront and what it is and how we can use it. We're going to look at getting data into AWS using Snowball and different other mechanisms. We're going to learn about course policies and encryption. We're going to get a general overview. This section is going to have quite a few hands-on tutorials. Welcome to video 4.1. Introduction to S3. In this video, we will be learning what S3 is, a few characteristics of S3, as well as its performance and data consistency model. What is S3? S3 is a highly scalable, durable object-based storage. It provides simple web interface to store and retrieve any amount of data. With S3, you pay only for what you use. You don't have to provision any capacity beforehand. Let's have a bit more introduction to S3. It is a simple key-based object storage. You have to think about storing files such as PNGs or videos or text files, but you wouldn't be able to run an operating system using S3. For that, you would need block-based storage such as EBS. The object size can vary from 0 bytes to 5 terabytes, and you have an unlimited number of objects that you can store. Multi-part upload API is strictly needed when your object size is over 5 gigabytes. AWS recommend using it when you are trying to upload an object, which is over 100 megabytes. You would then need to complete multi-part upload API. Uh, this operation provides multi-part upload by assembling previously uploaded parts. There are a few benefits of using multi-part upload, which include you can upload parts in parallel, and in any order to improve throughput, you can upload object parts over time, and you can upload an object as you are creating it. On a successful upload, be that multi-part or not, you are going to receive an HTTP 200 response code. Files are stored within buckets. Think about buckets as folders. By default, we have 100 buckets per account. This limit can be increased by contacting AWS and requesting a service limit increase. Bucket names must be unique globally. So think about this as a DNS. Uh, any bucket that you create must be unique globally and must comply with uh, certain DNS criteria that AWS recommend. We're going to look at that a bit later on. But the URL that is once you have created a bucket is uh, HTTPS s 3 region nameamazonawscom slash bucket name. Just to bear in mind that if you create a bucket in uh, North Virginia or US East 1, this URL is going to look like HTTPS s 3 amazonawscom slash bucket name. So for US East 1 or North Virginia, you're not going to have the region name as part of the URL path. In S3, you can specify a region for your bucket, and this will help you to optimize latency and to comply with regulatory requirements. Also, there is no transfer of your data to other regions unless you explicitly request so. Now let's talk about data consistency. We have read after write consistency for puts of new objects. And this means that you can retrieve the object or objects that you have created immediately after you have uploaded them. The eventual consistency. Then there is eventual consistency for override puts and deletes. This means that when you override an existing object or you delete an object, if you immediately try to retrieve the object, you might still get an older version of the data. Example, if you have a text file that you add a new sentence to and you re-upload it, you can still get the original version of the file. 
This is because S3 is replicated across facilities and it can take a bit of time to propagate the new changes. Now let's talk about the request rate and performance that S3 offers. S3 scales automatically to support very high request rates. Now there are two different situations that we have to think about when we're exercising a lot of requests on S3. If we get a rapid increase or a burst in the number of requests, for example, over 800 get requests per second, or over 300 put, list, or delete requests per second, you should open a support case with AWS to avoid temporary limits. Then there is the case where we could have consistent high workload, something over 300 get requests per second, or over 100 put, list, or delete requests per second. And for this, to ensure best performance and scalability, we should follow the AWS best practices. And these include, for a mix of request types such as we could mix get request with put, list, and delete request, we have the following situation. We should never store our object key names in a sequential manner because this introduces a performance problem. Amazon S3 maintains an index of object key names in each AWS region. And object keys are stored in UTF-8 binary ordering across multiple partitions in that index. The key name dictates which partition the key is stored in. If we use a sequential prefix, for example, a timestamp or an alphabetical sequence, this will increase the likelihood that Amazon S3 will target a specific partition for a large number of keys. And this in turn will mean that the IO capacity will be overwhelmed for some of the partitions. So what they recommend is to introduce some randomness in our key name prefixes. Uh, so we could add a hex hash key prefix to our key name. Those are just three or four random characters that we prepend to our object key names. Or the second case would be to reverse a key name string. So this would actually mean that operations will not overwhelm a single index partition. Because if you reverse the application ID strings, we would have key names with random prefixes. That could be a different case. But there is second type of best practice. It's regarding consistent and intensive GET request types. So for this, AWS recommend using CloudFront in front of S3 to cache our object. This will mean that we're going to have lower latency and a high data transfer rate because the objects will be closer to our users. And as well, we're going to have fewer direct requests to S3, which in turn will reduce our costs. 